Good morning. It is great to be here with you guys this morning and see all of you. Um, Pastor Tim, his mother is having her 90th birthday this weekend. And so let's all just really quick wish her happy birthday. One, two, three, happy birthday. That's an awesome, uh, it's amazing to be able to reach 90. We just celebrated my grandpa's 90th birthday last fall, and it's what an accomplishment. So be sure when you uh, see Pastor Tim next to congratulate him and uh, wish him, wish her a happy birthday. Um, so I am Charity Sandoz. Some of you know me, some of you don't. I've known many of you for probably about 15 years. Um, I grew up... Uh, well, started out in western Nebraska and then moved a little bit north of St. Paul. And, um, well, I went to Trinity Bible College and then spent five years in Spearfish, South Dakota. I just have to say, Spearfish, South Dakota is like the most pretty place in the world. It is gorgeous. I was very blessed to be there. I was a kids and outreach and then associate pastor there for five years. And then recently, this last summer, I'm taking some time to finish up my master's and partner with Rural Advancement, as Trent said. And so um, if you want to know more about that, you can come on Saturday. You're all welcome. It's just going to be a great opportunity to grow and continue to learn giftings and things. And that is in partnership. My parents, Dwight and Nadine, lead that ministry. And um, greetings from them. This Sunday, they are watching some of my nieces and nephews get baptized. And so it's a great uh, day to celebrate that. I'm sorry, my voice is a little rough today. I was on my way back from our pastor's district council in South Dakota and then a baby shower yesterday, and I lost a tire on the way. And so due to circumstances, there was no good Samaritan to help. Nobody stopped, but thankfully, we're part of the family of God and people know people. And so someone from one of the other area churches, he's doing the interim, he was a mechanic. He drove like an hour and helped me put it back on, but I didn't get into like 2.30 this morning. So... Um, if my voice cracks, that is why. Um, but we're going to have a really quick um, Dale Ackerman. He's going to come up, and uh, we're going to do something kind of fun here. Um, so if I can get the mic. Sorry, I didn't see that. Thanks. All right. So we have a few questions for Dale. Um, first stop. Um, you happen to have a bike and seem to really enjoy that, right? That's correct. How <laughs> often do you ride? Oh, every day that I can. Probably four or five days out of the week normally if the weather permits. And about how far do you ride? Well, anywhere from 15 to 25 or 30 and occasionally longer if it's a good day and I'm feeling good. <laughs> so... That's pretty awesome. Uh, Dale has helped to raise money for missions, doing missions mm -hmm. bike rides. Typically about how far does that end up taking you when you do the bike ride in the summer? As high as uh, 500 miles in a week. Wow. That, that's the, the maximum. And uh, that happened about three times, I think. So. That's pretty amazing. I think we should all give him a hand. That's pretty impressive. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I would guess that any of us, if we tried you would run us into the ground. So, <laughs> but really quick, where do you keep your bike? Oh, well, we have a, an extra garage uh, mm -hmm. room in it for it to keep it inside because it's um, carbon fiber is pretty expensive to buy. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of a back injury, I'm required to ride a, a tricycle. My granddaughter la laughed at that, but <laughs> I call it a trike. <laughs> That's awesome. So, uh, curious, how long would it take for you to notice that your bike was missing? Not very long. <laughs> Not very long? <laughs> Walk by it about every day, going out to the garage for something, feed how the squirrels or whatever. <laughs> how would you feel if that happened? Well, I wouldn't feel very good because the manufacturer is not making them now. Oh, no. And uh, they may make them again, so I'd probably be out of luck for a while. So, yeah. don't want that to happen. That's pretty crazy. Well, thank you, Dale. Um, appreciate that. You can give Trent the mic. Okay. Um, appreciate that. Now, that might seem a little strange, but how long? Thank you, Dale. Let's think about really quick. What is something that you do on a regular basis, something you use all the time? Think about someone shout out. What do you use all the time? Cell phone. Cell phone. What else? 
Coffee maker, Bible, what else? Your car, yeah, you notice that, if that went missing pretty quick. I just have to say, Trent's not very good at noticing when things go missing. Um, I've been taking his phone, but, uh, <laughs> so the question today is, how long would it take for you to notice if God's word was missing in your life? We're going to be looking at 2 Kings 22, where the people of Israel did not notice the word of God was missing and how important we have the word of our God in our lives. Really quick, I was just going to say, if you are new here today, we are a Pentecostal Assemblies of God church. What that means, and it's fitting because today we are... Um, looking at the Bible. Today's message is live the word. And so if you're here today, we, what we do is we just read the Bible. We know God is the same God as he was then. We believe he can do the same things. That's why we prayed for healing, because all throughout scripture, God heals. So we pray for healing. We pray uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit because all this is founded in Scripture. So if you're new here today, you might have some questions. Know that what we do is we are trying to take the God's Word and live it out as best as we can in our daily lives. So we want to found our lives on Scripture. So today's message is coming from 2 Kings 22 and 23. So we're going to start in verse 3 of 2 Kings 22 says, now it came about in the 18th year of King Josiah. By the way, King Josiah started when he was eight. I don't know how many of you would like to have your king be eight years old. Um, might be better than if they're 88, but we're going to, he started out at eight years old. And the king sent Shephan, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, the scribe to the house, the Lord saying, go up to Hilkah, the high priest, that he may count the money brought into the house of the Lord, which the do doorkeepers have gathered from the people. And then let them deliver it into the hands of the workmen who have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And let them give it to the workmen who are in the house of the Lord to repair the damage in the house. So the carpenters, the builders, the masons, they all start. They do their work. They're firing timbers and, to repair the house. He says, no accounting shall be made with them for the money delivered into their hands because they deal faithfully. Meaning they're honest, they're trustworthy, you can know that they are going to be doing what they're saying. By the way, I'm reading out of the New American Standard Version, so um, there's lots of good versions out there. This happens to be the one that I'm reading out of. Um, then Hilkiah the high priest said to Shef and the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shephan, who read it. And Shephan, the scribe, came to the king and brought back word to the king, saying that, you know, they've done what they're supposed to. Um, everything's going right with the temple. But then he says, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. And Shephan read it in the presence of the king. And it came about when the king heard the words of the book of the law that he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, Achim, the son of Shephan, Akbar, there's a lot of Hebrew names in here, the son of Melchiah, the Shephan, the scribe, and Isaiah, the king's servant, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me and the people and all Judea concerning the words of this book that have been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that burns against us, because our fathers have not listened to the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. So they go and they send word to Hulda, the prophetess, and um, her husband is the keeper of the wardrobe. She lives in Jerusalem in the second quarter, and they speak to her, and she says to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Tell the man who sent you to me, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I bring evil on this place and on its inhabitants, even all the words of the book which the king of Judah has read, because they have forsaken me and have burned incense to other gods that they might provoke me to anger with all the work of their hands. Therefore, my wrath burns against this place, and it shall not be quenched. But to the king of Judah, who sent you to you, inquire of the Lord, thus you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, regarding the words which you have heard. Because your heart was tender... And you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard that I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they should become a desolation and a curse. And you have torn your clothes and wept before me. Meaning he's mourning. He's like, look at all the sin of what we are doing. We have angered God because we are so far from his commands. She says, you have humbled yourself and you have mourned what is going on. She says, therefore, behold, I will gather you to your fathers and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace. Neither shall your eyes see all the evil which I will bring on this place, meaning he's not going to see it all, but it's coming. So they brought back word to the king. 
God, we thank you that your word is faithful and true and we can trust you and that your word is alive, it is a true then and it is true now. I ask that you will help each one of us to open up our hearts and eyes to you and you will speak to us your word today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. This is something we're going to say over and over and over today. There is first, read the word, pray the word, live the word, and teach the word. So let's read the word, pray the word, live the word, and teach the word. One more time. Read the word, pray the word, live the word, and teach the word. These are how we are going to apply this. When we read the Bible, we discover God's voice and direction for us. He has so much for you and I. And when we read his word, we can trust that he is going to speak. God speaks to his people through his word. It's the same. The Bible is not just true for the people back then when it was written. It's not just true for some. It's not just true for pastors and leaders, but it's true for you. It's true for the everyday life, and the Bible is relevant. You know, there's so often different areas we think, oh, man, that really doesn't seem like it applies. I remember as a kid reading, like, well, that doesn't have any bearings in my life and things today. You know, that's kind of from way back then. And now as I get older and experience more things, it's like, oh, wait, all those things are important. They have so much for you and I. The Bible is relevant. It is true. And when you read it, God is going to reveal himself and speak to you. And he has treasure for you in his word. Everything is interconnected. When you look at through scripture over and over and over, like it never gets old. It's amazing. It's like, wow, all of these pieces connect. Everything means something. Nothing in it is unimportant. It's all there for a reason because it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. He inspired the authors to write his message, his story, great story for the world. Sorry, I'm trying to make this work. Okay, so really quick, treasure. God has treasure in his word. There are, in throughout the sanctuary, and I don't know where they're at, um, there are three candy bars. And so really quick, look around and see, can you find the three candy bars? If you find it, hold it up. We found one. Someone else found it. There's two. There's one more. Three, there we go, one, two, three. We, so there is treasure, and when you come to church on Sunday, God has a treasure for you, but he also has treasure for you every time you encounter his word. Sorry, I didn't have uh, enough to be able to get candy bars for every single person, but God does have treasure more valuable than chocolate for you. And so you can read his word and find the treasure. Really quick, here are some tips for reading the word. And so... Reading, how do you read the Bible? Now, there's other things that we're going to be continuing on as the main stuff, but these are some tips, practical tips for reading the Bible. First off, and this is something that I want us to try to do for the next two weeks. When you go to read the Bible, ask the Holy Spirit, tell me what you want to say to me today. Ask, before you even start, ask God to tell you what he is going to speak because the word of God is true it's for you and me, and God wants to speak to you. So prepare your heart. It, just take that five seconds, ten seconds, and say, what do you want to speak to me today? Maybe, should I take the handheld? Would that be better? It's the wire. It's the wire from the way back to the phone. Yeah, that's right. Yes. So I don't want it to be distracting for everyone the whole service. There we go. We'll try that. Okay. Thank you. All right. So ask the Holy Spirit, what do you want to speak to me today? And so then we're going to start out with that as the basis. What are you wanting to say? And then here's something important. If you have not developed the discipline yet to read the Bible regularly, which most people haven't, you'll find over and over there are many, many people who have lived, they've gone to church for decades and have never read the entire Bible. And so if you have not developed the discipline to read regularly, I would encourage you start with like three to five minutes. Don't try to read seven chapters your first, like, while. Now, maybe God's going to start speaking to you, and it's like, wow, this is so good. Then, you know, go ahead. But if you're like, 
oh man, I don't have time to read seven chapters. Just start reading three to five minutes. Just take a small section and read and let that be a start. Start small, but start now. Start reading a little bit and then you can build on that and keep growing. If you have, um, find a regular place and time that you read. Maybe you want to read before you get out of bed. Like, you're like, okay, I'm gonna quick read this and uh, then go do stuff. Maybe you have a longer lunch break at work and there's no one else around, you could read then. Or, you know, wherever it is, find a place and a time that you consistently read on a regular basis. If you struggle with reading, maybe um, you are just not a reader at all, or you're super busy, like if you have small kids and they need held a lot, um, put on an audio Bible. God's word is still God's word, and listening to it is powerful. So put on an audio Bible, and actually that's a really quick way to get through. Um, a cousin of mine at her church, she had the folks try to listen to the Bible and see how quickly they could listen to it. And one of the guys was a trucker, and he started listening to the Bible about every three weeks. He would get through the whole thing, and just because he was trucking and uh, didn't have anything to do as he was going down the road. And so um, listening to the Bible is really powerful. There's tons of apps for that. Um, you, there's free apps. You don't have to pay anything, um, but that's a good way to start. And then... Um, there's days that are crazy busy, and you have, like, all of a sudden, everything goes wrong, um, kind of like my yesterday happened. And so I would encourage you take, and if you can't, like, man, I can't read everything. So uh, just instead of beating yourself up, just be like, you know what, I'm going to read one verse, or I'm going to read one small section. If you don't have time to read the whole thing and what you normally do, just do something. Do something. It doesn't have to be everything, but do something. And then... Um, also, I would encourage you to read like two places at once. So that way when you're reading the law and the prophets and the Psalms and some of those kind of parts that are more teaching and longer, then having some narrative sections of the Bible along with, then it kind of helps you to keep engaged, especially when you're early on in reading the Bible and you're not as used to it. And so then you can kind of keep things tying in. All right, just a couple more things. If, you, um, if you've not ever read the Bible or really anything in it, I would encourage you to start out. There's a few books to start with. Read Genesis, because that's the foundation of everything. The first part of Exodus, that's super important. Get through Passover into the desert. So read Genesis, the first part of Exodus, and then Luke and Acts, so you can get the story of Jesus and the early church. And then read Ephesians, because Ephesians is it's sort of like the mini Romans. It's small, it's condensed, but it's got so much deep truth in it. So Genesis, the first part of Exodus, um, Luke, Acts, and Ephesians. And so that'll give you kind of a good overarching, and then you can start to dive in and grow, um, because we need to get the narrative of Scripture. And then uh, find someone who is going to keep you accountable? This is true of any discipline. I don't know about you, like, okay, so I hate working out. I hate going to the gym. And I had a friend that we would go to the gym to work out together where I lived. And I was much more consistent, went like three, four times a week. Unfortunately, we weren't the best because she and I got to talking. We talked for like an hour and a half and we worked out for five minutes. But at least we went and we did something. So, uh, but find someone that you can talk to about reading the word. And so it was like, hey, what have you read lately? How are you doing? What's God saying? Um, are you applying what's God saying? And it'll help to develop things and go deeper, and then you're having some good um, God moment conversations. And then lastly, after you read the Bible, ask, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do with this? Because God doesn't just speaking and just like, oh man, that was good, but the Bible should affect every area of your life. No area should go unimpacted. It works in every area. Everything in the Bible is relevant to your life. So we're going to read the word, pray the word, live the word, and teach the word. Let's read the word, pray the word, live the word, and teach the word. Let's read the word, Pray the word, live the word, and teach the word. Let's try to say it louder. The kids can't even hear us. So let's read the word, pray the word, live the word, and teach the word. You know, we can memorize things too. The kids do all the time, so it's really not fair. Um, okay, so we need to be living the word. The word of God requires application. 
where things impact. Now, going on with our story in 2 Kings 23. So they've gotten the word. They had lost the word in the temple. They did not know where it was at, and they had not noticed until it's rediscovered. They read it and they realize the sin that they have is astronomical and they are facing God's judgment. This is pretty serious stuff. And actually, as we get into chapter 23, we're going to find out how bad it is because we're like, oh, yes, maybe they're, you know, altering, uh, offering a sacrifice, um, lighting incense here, there to these other gods, but, you know, they're serving Yahweh as a whole. Uh Uh-uh. This is serious drift from the word of God. And so, then they ask, inquire the Lord. The prophetess Hulda, she speaks the word of God and says, judgment is coming. God honors your humbleness, but judgment is coming. And so this is then the response. That the king sent, and they gathered to him all the elders of Judah and of Jerusalem. And the king went up to the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the priests and the prophets and the people, both small and great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments. And his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to carry out the words of the covenant that were were written in this book, and all the people entered into covenant. Here what we find, they are re-entering into the covenant. They're like, oh, we've messed up. We need God. We need to follow him with everything in us. And so they are recommitting. Covenant is a dedication, a recommitment. It's more binding than any contract. It's made by blood. It is saying that my life is forfeit if I break this. Thankfully for us, God is the one who takes on our breaking of the covenant, and we don't have to suffer that. Then the king commanded Hilkiah the high priest and the priests of the second order, the doorkeepers, to bring out of the temple all the vessels that were made for Baal, for Asherah. So we have finding in the temple itself, there are these vessels and idols to these fake gods. And for the host of heaven, he burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of the Kidron and carried the ashes to Bethel. And he did with the adulterous priest whom the king of Judah had appointed to burn incense in the high places. So not only do they have these false idols, they have priests to these fake gods burning incense in the temple and so in the surrounding area. And so they take them out and um, they they have them killed because of their worshiping these fake gods. And they are bringing sin in life. Now, this, it, we're like, okay, maybe that's a little harsh, but no, when you get into this, it gets even worse. He broke down the houses of the male cult prostitutes, which were in the house of God, where the women were weaving hangings of Asherah. So they're having male prostitutes in the temple for these fake gods because worshiping these fake gods was not just like kind of worshiping. It was worshiping where there was sexual sin and there was murder and all kinds of horrible, evil things happening. And he brings out the priests from all the cities of Judah and defiled the high places where the priests had burned incense from Geba to Beersheba. And he broke down the high places of the gate which were at the entrance of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city. And then so they go on um, and... They also destroy the place, the high places, where people would sacrifice their children. Anytime that there was crop failure or anything like that, when they wanted to have a good harvest, they would take their children, um, sometimes older children, not just infants, and they would kill them and burn them on these fires to offer to these fake gods so that way they could have what they wanted. This is how far Israel had drifted from the one true God. This is what happened when they did not have God's word as their foundation. And so they do away with all of this and they repent and they break down and this continues on, there's so much that they do and um, they take even the graves of those that have promoted these false gods and they burn the bones on the altar saying, no, this was an evil thing and we are not going to continue any longer. And so then, um, then after that, it says that the king 
commanded all the people, this is verse 21, celebrate the Passover to the Lord your God as it is written in the book of the covenant. So again, they come back to celebrate Passover, God's covenant with his people Israel, that they will not die by the death angel if they follow him. And so the Passover, so this is why it's important to read Exodus if you haven't read it. Like so much of scripture keeps referencing this Passover and what Jesus did on the cross references that as well. And so they... Um, celebrate it says like there had never been a passover celebrated in israel before in all the times of the judges and the kings and so they uh, also they remove all the medians and the people like they seek spirits and try to talk to the dead they remove all of that and it says in verse 25 and before him there was no king like him who turned the lord with all his heart with all his soul with all his might according to the law of moses nor did any like him arise after him all right so much is in that. It's pretty long. You can go back and read more of it later. But God's word, the hearing of God's word caused a response. It was this, oh my, we need God to move. And there was immediate action. When you read the word of God, not only do we need to read it, but we need to apply it where it affects our lives. We let the Holy Spirit work through his word and speak and work in us. Now, I have a grandpa who has not followed God very righteously throughout his life as consistently as he might, but he grew up knowing the word of God, and it became so deep and imprinted. One time, my brother Nathan, the tall one, was um, working for him, and there was this cow they had just fed the cows, and they were just standing around, and nothing was like, you know, they were just looking at the cows. It's not like they're doing anything, and they had just been fed, which most of the time cows are pretty like, okay, you fed me. You're not a threat. I'm going to just um, eat here and live in peace. Well, uh, this one cow, she jerked her head up. She is kind of a crazy hat. Her, like, blew her nose and, you know, got that stand, that stiff stand. You'll, if you work cows, you know what I'm talking about. And she snorted and she swung around and she took off running, even though no one had done anything. And Grandpa just shook his head. He goes, the wicked flee when no one pursueth. And so that's a proverb. And so he, uh, there's so much deep in his life that it applied even to moving cows. So every area of our lives, there's scriptures that can apply, and it works into our lives. The narrative of scripture is God's narrative for the world, the narrative for his church, and the narrative for you and I. Our lives should emulate, it should reflect this throughout every area. So what is the great narrative of scripture, the overarching story? What is it? God made man. They're made in the image of God, in the image of God, he created them. And then what happens? What happens? They sin. There's the fall. They mess, they mess up. So then they, um, they go through life on their own. Everything is terrible. Like they keep messing up royally over and over and over again, which we all do that. And then God calls them to be a light to the Gentiles because there is a Savior. We are fallen in need of a Savior. And so all the scripture, Passover, everything, um, you know, Abraham taking Isaac up on the mountain, all of this is pointing towards Jesus, who is our sacrifice. He takes our place because we have broken covenant, and he redeems us. He saves us. And now we are not just to be saved, though. God has us reflect to the whole world, just like he made Israel to be a kingdom of priests, to reflect to the whole world his name. And so everyone might know him. That is the narrative of scripture, God's narrative for humanity, his narrative for the church, and his narrative for you. You were made in the image of God, and I was made in the image of God. We messed up. We have all sinned. There is not one perfect person here besides Jesus because he's present, but you know what I mean. So there's no one perfect here. We need a Savior. Jesus has saved us. And I want to encourage you, if you have not asked Jesus to save you, today is a great day to do that. So either you are in need of a Savior or you have been saved, and it's our choice to surrender. God saves us, redeems us, and now you are called to be a light to those around you. That is the application of scripture. 
We recognize who we are in relation to God. We are saved by him and changed by him, and we work to see others come to know him. All of those pieces have to be involved in our application in order for us to be really taking the Bible at his word and going into every area. Reading and obeying scripture includes passing it on to others. If you are not witnessing if you're never sharing Jesus with people around you and you're not telling others and helping them to grow in faith and passing along the word of God, then you are not applying scripture to its full intent. We need to have the Holy Spirit work through us to spread the word of God to all of those around us. Now, you might say I'm too old. Well, I have something about that. Um, this last week, I was at a pastor's conference, and there's a missionary, Linda Arzuni. Her husband, they were, uh, they were missionaries in Africa. Her husband was Lebanese, and he had come to Christ. He was a Muslim man and radically saved, and they then were missionaries for years in West Africa, uh, in French-speaking West Africa, different countries. He recently died of cancer, and she was just kind of like, well, I'm done. Like, what do I do? Well, but God it wasn't finished yet. God has spoken to her. She's 77 years old. She's going back on the field to help train more missionaries. And she put it like this, and I think it's a great illustration for us today. How many of you, you have toothpaste, and you squeeze out every single pit in the tube? Yeah? Do you waste it, or do you use all of it? You're like, no, it might not be that expensive toothpaste, but I'm going to use every last bit I can get out, right? There's still toothpaste in your tube. If you are here today, you are above ground, you are still called to be a witness and pass on God's word to others. There is still what he wants to do in you. I'm sorry, I know this isn't toothpaste. Don't use it. Otherwise, you will have glued teeth. And so God is working through you. There is still toothpaste in your tube. Every time you look at toothpaste, if you're an older person and you are like, have struggled with this feeling of inadequacy and giving up, I hope you brush your teeth twice a day. If you do, um, you, if you don't, you should. But if you take your toothpaste out and realize, no, there's still toothpaste in the tube. God's not done with me yet. He still has a plan to work through your life. And so taking God's word, we pass it on to others. We witness, we apply it to every area of our lives. It is absolutely essential that we teach the Word of God to future generations. God wants your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, both those in the natural and in the spiritual, to know him and be raised up to maturity. And if the elders don't pass on the word of God, we will face what Israel faced, where they had forgotten the word, they lost it, and they had it no more. That is the consequences of not passing on God's word. We will become like Israel throughout Judges and all these different kings because it has to be passed on. We must apply the word to every area of our lives. We develop the spiritual habits. My other grandfather was a much different person, and he was so dedicated to reading God's word. He had memory loss at the end of his life, um, uh, some dementia, and he couldn't remember if he had read the Bible and done devotions, prayed for people or not. So he would take and he would, um, oftentimes with grandma, he would be like, oh, we didn't do devotions yet. We haven't prayed for the kids. We haven't read God's word yet. And then he would reread. And sometimes they'd do devotions like two, three, four times in a day because he couldn't remember. That is a developing a discipline of a deep connection to God's word. My other grandma um, she has Parkinson's disease, and I went and visited her this last summer. And when I was up there, she, uh, Parkinson's, when it gets to a certain stage, you know, the person's facial features don't even look the same because they're so far receded in uh, their memory loss. And I had gone to visit her. You know, she lives far away in North Dakota. I don't get to visit her very often. And one day she was just doing very poorly. Like, you know, she's had hallucinations. She can't quite comprehend what's going on. She knows who I am, but that's about it. No conversation ability. And so I was like, well, what do I do? I came to visit Grandma. Like, I don't want to just leave. I don't get to see her very often. So I took her with my Bible and started to read. And Grandma was a student of God's Word. And after reading for about an hour, her face changed. It lit up. Her features returned back to more normal. And we were able to have this really good conversation, the best conversation I've had with her in years. And it's because God's Word is affected. It impacts. We develop the discipline, and God is going to work. There is power in the Word of God. So we read the Word, 
We pray the word, we live the word, and teach the word. Wayne Cordero was a pastor of a four-square church in Hawaii, and this was the biggest four-square church. Uh, when they started, uh, for many, many years, they were not able to get a building because buildings in Hawaii are extremely expensive and hard to obtain. And so he had to, um, they had to take and pack in chairs, sound equipment, worship, every single thing for thousands of people in and out every week. And that's a lot to organize, not to mention all the regular church things. And he was exhausted. He was spiritually de uh, depleted, and he had depression from so such overworking. He was discouraged. And so he had stopped most of his spiritual disciplines. The only thing that he did left was read the Word of God. And uh, his church is now like 14,000 people. So it has like this great impact. He has a well-known speaker. So he goes to speak in Denver. And they fly him in, and there's a change in hotels, so they end up having him stay at the hotel at the airport. No one knows that that's the hotel where he's at, though. The airport had lined it out, and so no one knows where it's at. Sorry about that, guys. Sometimes we need extra fixing in life. Thank you. Okay, let's try that out. Okay, so he had um, had the word of God. You can't hear? No, maybe I should just use the handphone. This is going to be easier. Sorry, guys. So he had the word of God, uh, but in his heart and things, but no one knew where he was at. He's in a spiritually depleted place. And when he's there, um, he eats his meal, and a woman, a very attractive woman, comes up to him and starts to talk to him. At first, uh, she asks him how his meal is and things, and he thinks that she is with the restaurant at the hotel, just, you know, checking on, making sure that clients are happy and stuff. You know how lots of times nicer places will do, and that's what he thought it was. After a little bit, he realized that she was not that at all. She was propositioning him, and in his mind, he thought, no one knows where I'm at. I could, like this glimmer, this thought goes through. No one knows where I'm at. No one would know. And in that moment, he sees a picture of Joseph fleeing from Potiphar's wife, going down the hallway of the restaurant. Joseph, remember, he was a slave, and Potiphar's wife wants to sleep with him, and he says no, and what does he do? He flees. And this pastor, uh, he sees Wayne, Pastor Wayne sees Joseph flee down the hall, and he goes, I'm sorry, I just saw a friend one run down the hall. I need to catch up with him. And he runs after out the hall, out of the room, and he was like, no way, because God worked through. He says, the word of God, Joseph, saved his marriage. And he was so discouraged later on, um, he was considering quitting. And Zechariah the prophet says, I will not abandon the shepherding of my people. Because in Zechariah it talks about this shepherd, this bad shepherd that abandons its flock. And Zechariah, that word called out to him, and he says, Joseph saved my marriage. Zechariah saved my ministry. All of us. We need the word of God in our lives. The word, it helps us to witness, to teach and pass on, but also we takes and roots out the sin, the ugly dark places. You know, like under the bed, you probably get cobwebs and spiders and, like, and you have like dust bunnies and things and that builds up dirt and you need to sweep out from under that. When we read the word of God, it's sweeping out the ugly, dirty, unseen things in our lives and helps to clean those up. And when we read the word of God, we will have a foundation to do all that he has called you to. Otherwise, you're going to be building on an unlevel foundation that will crumble. It's like when they build a house and um, my uh, pastors in Spearfish, they had a house in Belfouche that was built on a fill where the land was and the contractor hadn't told them when they bought the house and they put, didn't put the pillars deep enough and so it started to shift, and everything started to crack, and the house was doing poorly. And so they had to then go in out years later and drill deep, deep pillars into the ground to be able to have a foundation so the house would stay strong. We need the Word of God to be our foundation and these deep pillars to hold us so we stay strong. The Scripture is, uh, is used to resolve conflict. How do you raise your family when you're interacting with people at work, when there's conflict with uh, siblings and parents? How do you deal with finances? legal issues. Did you know that most of the legal law of many countries that have what we would call appropriate laws today is built on Old Testament law? 
It is. Legalities. Every situation is applicable. New believers and long-term believers alike all need the word of God in our lives. Whether you decide to follow Jesus today or yesterday, or you have followed Jesus from the moment you were a child, and he has been with you every moment of your life, you, like you, since then you need to have God's word in your life. And so we sing songs that have scripture, and we use it to memorize the word. We, we incorporate the word into our everyday lives. Find a time. Find a place. Let God God's word, work in your life. Ask him, God, what do you want to speak to me today? Then read it and take the time to say, I will apply this. Let it work. Let it impact your life. And don't just read it and go on. No, it's not just a book full of stories. It's not just good ideas and philosophy. This is transformative. It is alive. It is as alive as anything that you can imagine. And God's word will speak to you. So what do we do? We read the word. We pray the word. We live the word. And we teach the word. Let's read the word, pray the word, live the word, and teach the word. God's word causes us to change. In Psalms 119, I want to encourage you to make that a study sometime soon. There's so much about reading God's word. He says, your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. You know, that pastor Wayne, he had God's word was so hidden in his heart that God gave him a vision of Joseph running down the hall. I love it. They says, I have a friend running down the hall. I need to go catch up with him. You know, God's word in your heart, hide it in your heart. Make it a lamp into your feet and a light into your path. They are so we we need the reviving of the word so we revise our soul. And his mercies come to us, our salvation according to his word. We trust what he says through his word and we rejoice. And lastly, in Psalms 119, it says, we, Our tongue shall speak of your word, for all your commandments are righteous. So let's read the word, pray the word, live the word, and teach the word. We pass on the word to others. As Deuteronomy 11 says, Therefore you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and your soul and bind them as a sign in your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Bind the words to your forehead like doorposts. And, and then it, uh, and it goes on. And then in Deuteronomy 6, 7 it says, You shall teach them diligently to your children. As you talk to them, when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up, teach them to your children, pass them on. In 11, 19, it says, teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house and you lie down, when you rise up. In Deuteronomy 31, now therefore write down this song for yourself and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that the song may be a witness for me. Pass the word of God on. Parents, teach it to your kids. You're not just like, oh, dragging them to church. No, this is true and alive. Help them to see it. Pray for healing. Be bold and confident. Apply the word and live the word. And then they will see that not only is it a book of stories and something our parents believe, but it is true. There's nothing like seeing God work as he, uh, we apply his word that shows the validity of his word. My brother Joel had a lot of questions about God when he was growing up, and he was not the most compliant child in the world, and he had um, a pretty strong will, and he might, he told us later on, you know, there was a point he was kind of drifting, but he knew that it was true, because so many times, you know, there were several times, my brother had crazy miracles, like one time he was in a football game, he got his leg broke, we prayed, they were going to put a cast on, they had to wait a week to put the cast on because of the, um, to let the swelling go down, we go back in, and he, like, did another x-ray to see, you know, make sure everything's all right. And his leg was completely fine. No, like, it, it, it was in the St. Paul Church. They prayed for him that Sunday. And uh, his leg was healed, completely healed. And he played a football game that week. So he was supposed to, like, be out for the rest of the season. But he was able to play that next week because God had healed him. And there was instance after instance that God showed himself true because the word of God, not only was it taught, but it was applied and it was shown that God is faithful and he is true and you can trust him. So parents, pass the word of God. Show them that it is true. Don't be afraid. When there's something going on, come down to the altar and pray. Let them see God be active. Grandparents, do the same thing. And then tell your kids, we prayed, God healed, God worked, he provided, he spoke, whatever he did in the situation, and tell them what's going on. Don't just, and then pass it on to other people. God wants to use you. God's narrative in his word for the church and for you is the same. You are made in the image of God. We have sinned, but Jesus has saved us. And now go and share with the others and pass it on. It's the same for all of us. We all have the Great Commission. 
We read the word, pray the word, live the word, and teach the word. And we can depend on him in all times. We can, uh, he is with us. And so we want to pass this on, this great commission. What is the great commission? Go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. It's exactly what Israel had forgotten in the temple. They did not teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, did they? They had forgotten the word of God. And when we forget the word of God, we're forgetting the great commission. And if we're forgetting the great commission, we're missing part of what God's word is wanting to work in our lives. And revival, this is our last thing. It's just me a couple more minutes. Revival comes from the word and the spirit working together in our lives and in the body of God, in the congregation. We come together as a community of faith. And we have the word of God and the spirit of God at work in this conjoined unity working and speaking through us. And we will then apply the Great Commission. This church is on the verge of revival. There is so much God is doing, but there is more that we can do, and that is passing it on to your children, passing it on to those around you. There is still toothpaste in your tube. Whether it is almost full or almost empty, every one of us still has time. So pass it on. Don't let it just sit and do nothing, but make it a word that you apply to others. Application of the word of God brings revival, just like it did in the book of Acts. In Acts 4, the people of God are facing persecution. They've been commanded not to preach the word of God anymore, not to do anything in the name of Jesus. But what happens? They go and they pray. And when they pray, they pray the word of God. They pray from the Psalms. And they're praying. The spirit of God comes on them again. And they are filled again with the Spirit. And they go out and they share the word of God boldly with those around them. And revival continues. And thousands and thousands of people are affected and impacted. The Great Commission used throughout the New Testament in history is the application of the whole narrative of Scripture. So the worship team is going to start playing. And as we respond, there's a few things that we can do practically this week. First of all, think of a time and a place that you can read. If you are like new to this, it's okay. Start now. Start small. It's better to start now than not at all. Don't beat yourself up over the past. God forgives. God works in our lives. It's not too late. But find a place and start to read. Let's take two weeks and ask God to speak to you before you read. Ask him to help you apply. Say, God... What do you want to say to me today? And then go into the word. And then afterwards say, God, how can I act this out? How can I live this out? And apply it. Let's try to live it out. Let's live out the Great Commission. Let's live out the narrative of Scripture. Each time you read, think about how this can impact you personally and your interactions with others. Because every relationship should be changed as we apply God's word. We should be the kindest, most generous people and the most joyful as we interact with others. And they should say something's different about you because we've applied God's word in our lives. And share him. Share Jesus. Tell someone you don't know about Jesus. Tell someone you do know. Tell someone that eh, you haven't told about before. Pray for the person that's checking you out at the store. Pray for your neighbors. And share Jesus. Teach it to others. Teach God's word. Find someone to disciple and mentor. You know something, so pass it on. If you're a brand new Christian, guess what? You know something. Maybe you're still seeking and figuring this whole God thing out. Well, you know more than many do because you're in the right place and you're realizing that there's something there that I can talk to. Uh, I can talk to that God, Jesus. If you've been following Jesus for years, man, you have so much wisdom. Pass it on. Don't let it be forgotten in the temple where no one knows the word anymore. Pass it on. We have a generation that hasn't had the word of God passed on, and it needs mothers and fathers of the faith who will share God's word. So let's pass it on. And then we're going to find accountability. Before you leave the room today, find someone and tell them what you're going to do.
where are you going to read, when are you going to read it, and have them check in on you. Check in on each other. If you've been baptized, you've said that you want to follow Jesus, then we should keep each other accountable because we're going to be better for it. And just say, hey, what's God been speaking to you today? How's that reading going? Have you been reading at a time? Is there a different time you find that works better? How are you applying it? What's been going on in your life? And pray for each other. So in our altar time, I want you to take and think of, and then they give us these handy-dandy note things here. There's pens in the back, and these are, by the way, they are great pens here at the church. Our church pens from where I was at were deplorable. They wouldn't write at all. You're blessed. So take and write down where and when you're going to read. Wrote, write down, remember the steps. God, what do you want to say to me today? Read, and then how can I live this out? Those are the three steps. And then, so you're going to take, we're going to have the worship team's going to sing a song, which by the way, this song is a great song full of scripture. It's so full of scripture. And so you're going to ask God, like you're going to find a time and a place. You're going to write down the three steps. What are the three steps? We say, what do you want to say to me? read how can I live this out and then before you leave today find someone to share what God is saying and doing when are you going to read who are you going to share Jesus with and just encourage you all of you there's still toothpaste in the tube you have time God has gifted you you have wisdom to share so let's pass it on Jesus, I thank you that we can look to you. You are the author of the greatest story, the narrative of humanity, and you're the author of each one of our stories. Speak to us. Help us to follow you. I ask that you will work in each of our lives. Help us to apply your word on a daily basis. Open up our hearts and our minds to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. I searched the world